what I'm really going to do is just sort of, I came here to tell you what I've been thinking about lately. I do that every once in a while. And, um, you know, you're going to tell me what you think of it, and hopefully you won't be shy. And if you get something out of it, great. And if not, at least I got some pizza. So how bad can it be? Um, that's a long drive for pizza. It's a long drive for pizza, that's true. Um, basically, I'm on a bit of a quest these days. Uh, and it's got to do with the idea of changing the funder evaluator dialogue. Uh, and I'm going to really talk a little bit about that, and that's the reason for it. What I really think is that the conversation between funders and donors needs to change. Uh, and so what I'm really trying to do is to talk to as many people as possible about this. And what I'm actually trying to do is put together a panel at, a panel at AEA, you know, hopefully with some government funding types and foundation funding types uh, to have this kind of a dialogue. Uh, although I haven't talked to anybody about doing the panel yet, so it remains to be seen if that's going to happen or not. But the reason I think it needs to change is because we basically do what we're paid for. Right? In other words, we evaluate programs that people put into place. Uh, and if we don't change the dialogue, then what I worry about is that we're not going to be asked the right questions. If we're not asked the right questions, we can't answer the right questions. Uh, and, and what I really think is that part of the problem is that um, <coughs> programs have complex behavior. Uh, but, those, but the dynamics of that complex behavior isn't recognized in the conversations that evaluators have with funders. And so the right kinds of outcomes, the right kind of relationships, the right kinds of program theories, they tend not to be built in. Uh, and I really don't have any worry whatsoever about our methodological expertise. I mean, it's not as if because behave, programs behave in a complex way, we don't know the right methodologies for evaluating them, because we do. You know, I mean, there are certain exotic tools for certain kinds of exotic issues. But for the most part, it's not that we can't develop methodologies to do this. It's that the conversations don't take place between the funders and the evaluators to allow this to take place. Uh, and I sort of made this picture just to give an image of what I mean. If you think about that top picture, the thing in the middle looks, you know, pretty much, you know, you could call it what you want. I mean, I tend to you know, loosely use the concept of logic model and uh, program theory interchangeably. And I know that a lot of people get bent out of shape about that. So, you know, if you want, I'll try to be careful in my language. But basically, I consider them all models. And by the way, I've actually stopped using the word logic model because that's such a value-loaded word these days. I just call them models. And since models are important in doing any kind of research, <coughs> I figure it's OK. But if you think about that picture in the middle, you know, it's not that different from the kind of diagram you'd work out, you know, with any kind of a funder for any kind of program. We have things that are connected and maybe there's a feedback loop in there and there are boxes and, you know, maybe you don't like that version, you like the Kellogg version, you know, so you've got, you know, columns of words. But you could turn those into boxes if you wanted to. And if you sit down with most funders, and begin to say, well, what's this program of yours, and how does it work, and what do you think is going to go on, and so on and so forth, it wouldn't be too hard to come up with something that looks like that middle box. So it means you can have a familiar conversation with people. And out of that comes, I don't know if you can read it, but that thing on the right says, do you design and execute an evaluation? Which is true. You have these conversations. You. Uh, get some consensus on what the model is, although I've actually never understood personally why everyone has to agree on the model, because you can easily have an evaluation that tests different models, but that's sort of a separate conversation about things. But if you did it the way you do it on the top, basically, I, we've all done that, and maybe you get into bigger arguments or smaller arguments about what should be connected to what or what the appropriate outcomes are, but everyone's kind of comfortable with it. Uh, the problem is, that the world pretty much works in a lot of ways the way that bottom works. 
Uh, and you'll notice two things. You'll notice on the left it has donor input and evaluator input on the right, and there is no arrow, familiar collaboration activity. Don't know how to talk to people about it. Uh, I use that picture in the middle basically to convey uh, the kinds of things that can happen with complex behavior, and I'm not going to go into details, but I, I threw in the bar chart to, to connote um, sort of power law distributions and the funny looking things in the middle just to show that you don't really know all of the elements of the program. Uh, and then there's a normal curve because truth is a lot of things do tend to be distributed that way. Uh, the picture on the right is basically a, uh, a bifurcation diagram for a logistic equation where you begin to get formally chaotic behavior. Um, and so I sort of put all those things together just to convey the idea that if you're going to talk to people about how programs are going to behave, these kinds of ideas need to be part of the conversation. And even if what comes out of that is a pretty straightforward evaluation, the things the evaluation are going to be trained on are not going to be the same kinds of things as that nice clean picture you see up on the top. <clears throat> You'll notice I threw some question marks in there. Because what I really mean is that because the dialogue can't take place, the models can't be built, and it says design and execute an evaluation, what you're really seeing there is a question mark, because it's kind of what's going to come out of that. So that's the picture to convey what I think the problem is, which is that uh, funders and evaluators need to have different kinds of conversations. So I, I have a question. Sure. As you're talking about funders and donors here, who is that really referring to? And I say this because so often I think evaluation work, uh, who we get the contract from, is right. not necessarily who's funding it. There's two or three different layers of funders or donors involved. Yeah, that's a complicated problem. Uh, I tend to have a very conservative view of things, which is who's paying me? Because the people who are paying me are the people I'm probably going to sit down with to develop these models and you know kind of figure out what the outcomes are going to be and how the program is going to behave and you know more or less those are the kinds of people but the problem you're bringing up actually is that programs tend to be funded of what we like to call organizational silos right and you know evaluators like to sort of beat their breasts and don sackcloth and ashes of the fact that there are really more connections than that, right, and that these programs are really connected with other problems, but the funding doesn't recognize that, and, and there's all that stuff. And by the way, I have a whole separate lecture on why it is I think that programs have to be simple, but that we can still think complexly anyway. Um, and I actually believe that's true. And I would be happy to expound upon that at length, but not right now. Uh, and I also think that, although we complain about silos and cubby holes, I think that silos in organizations are incredibly adaptive. And that we're a lot better off for having isolated silos than not having isolated silos, despite the downside. And that's another whole lecture that I promise not to give right now. I, so. My issue right now is, so when you say the conversation needs to change, the question might be, the first question to ask maybe, is there a conversation? Because oftentimes... Oh, you are in a depressed mood. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so I, is some kind of conversation. Well, but it's very limited. Right? It's true. I mean, it's, your solicitation comes out, your RFP comes out, your... Um, your uh, terms of reference comes out, whatever it is, and lately you see more and more very specific what evaluator, evaluators are asked to do. Yeah. Whether you think it's the right thing or not, right? You're sure. asked to test this program using an RCT. You're asked to do this by answering this question. Yeah. So it's right away, of course you're proposing to do exactly that because, doll, <coughs> you want to get the money. Well. I'll say two things about that. One is, maybe the situation is even more depressing than I think it is. Um, <laughs> but the other deal is, usually when I do an evaluation, I can build in a first step that says, let's sit down and build a model. 
And I haven't ever been involved in an evaluation contract where someone says, well, sorry, we don't want to pay for that. We're just going to tell you what it is. So it's usually some opportunity to talk to people. But yeah, I mean, if you're stuck even worse, then you're stuck even worse, which makes it even more necessary to have these conversations because you need to push the conversation back to the requirements definition time. Mm -hmm. which I mean, means especially not talking about federal <coughs> government, right? Yeah. There is not a lot of choice. And in the end, you talk maybe to people that implement the project. Right. And you talk about what other information do they need, and that's where conversation takes place. Yeah. But in the end, you still have to do exactly what the government wants, right? Yeah. There's no. Well, that sort of makes things harder. Right. Because right now, my fantasy is that you can have a conversation with the people who are paying you to do the evaluation. You can develop a model. But to the extent that what you're saying is true, you need to push that conversation back even further. Mm -hmm. You know, think about the RCTs, mm -hmm. right? Leaving aside whether they're good things or bad things, why do people ask for them? It's because at some point, you know, they took a course in graduate school or whatever. At some point, they were led to believe that RCTs are good things. And that came from somewhere. That came from dinner party conversation. It came from courses they took early in their career. It took from came from sort of misplaced understanding of taking the way you test drugs and test everything else that way. So you know the conversation there really needs to be made, you know pushed back even further. Fortunately, I haven't been trapped that way. But yeah, that's true. Good luck. I'm sorry. I'm pushing the conversation. No, it's, I mean, things like that are years long. If you said to me, how do you change public opinion about the ubiquitous value of RCTs, you know, you've got to start thinking about, well, the people who are developing these requirements now, maybe in their mid-40s, where'd they get this idea in the first place? You would trace that back to some undergraduate course they took somewhere. So, I mean, right. it's kind of the way you need to deal with it. And since everybody thinks that we're so wise, they'll clearly listen to us. But imagine I were giving this lecture, not to you guys, uh, but to a bunch of people taking course in public administration or public policy or in an MPA program, who would be the kind of people 15 years from now who'd be writing those requirements. And that's kind of what I mean about shifting the dialogue. Uh, so you need to change things like what are the outcomes going to be? Uh, how might outcomes be connected? I mean, these are all the kinds of conversations that need to take place. Uh, you need to talk to people about patterns of change. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a few of my favorite examples, but you can dip into the world of complexity and come up with all kinds of examples. But uh, these are kind of examples of the kinds of things where the people doing the funding don't think change can happen this way. Uh, and you need to point out it can. Um, I actually have come to the belief that change either happens very slowly and incrementally or very quickly, but it never happens at an intermediate level of speed. Um, and I have a lot of reasons for believing that uh, as well. Um, I think one of the ways to organize this conversation is by using models. Uh, and I'm not using the word program theory, I'm not using the word logic model. But any kind of investigation always has some kind of model behind it. It might be implicit, it might be fancy, it might be simple, but there's a model. And, and we'll talk about that as well towards the end as kind of a unifying principle. Oh, what time do I have to shut up? <laughs> One o'clock. That, that's important to know if I don't get all everything there. So here, this is a picture that I made, and I don't know if the picture works or not, but it's the kind of thing that I've been thinking a lot lately in terms of the dialogue between funders and uh, evaluators. Uh, I'm beginning to think about, I hate the word evaluand, but whatever the thing is that you're evaluating, whether it's communities or school systems or people or who is ever supposed to change or get better, you know, whatever you want to call it based on your intervention. What we really do is pick something and say, that's a problem, we're going to make it better. Uh, the difficulty is, if you think about these things as organisms uh, sort of roaming around on a fitness landscape, uh, they really have multiple needs. Uh, and if you throw all of your resources at one of them, you're going to make it difficult to meet the other needs. 
Uh, and that's something that people don't think about much. And my favorite example is, you know, you got a program to uh, help uh, with AIDS prevention and treatment in some country in Africa. Well, that's a very good thing to do. And I think people ought to evaluate that and see what it does in terms of the incidence and prevalence of AIDS and all that sort of stuff. But the problem is if you took all of your money and all of your training and all of your people and everything else and oriented them around AIDS, what does that do to the public health system? Right? People have other problems too. Um, and so you're sort of distorting the system. Uh, and you're distorting the system because what you're saying is I'm ignoring the fact that there are multiple criteria upon which this, quote, organism, unquote, needs to succeed, and I'm only going to try to work on one of them. Well, that's not going to happen because somehow, whoever you're dealing with, whether it's communities or people or whatever, they're going to adapt to deal with these other needs as well, right, because that's what they need to succeed. Uh, and so when you begin to get a lot of these bizarre unintended consequences, what you're really seeing is the organism that's trying to adapt to all the needs, of, you know, and you're ignoring most of them. Uh, so my view of the world is if you want to have a good program, you pick outcomes that are as uncorrelated as possible, and you try to jointly optimize them. Now, that's an awfully easy thing to say, an awfully difficult thing to do. Uh, one reason is because whoever you're dealing with isn't funded to jointly optimize. If they're funded to deal with AIDS, that's what they care about. That's what they're rewarded on. If you've got a program to teach kids to pass those high-stakes tests at the end of the year, um, you know, you might, as a person, care that the kids have a love of reading. But if you said, let's make love of reading one of the outcomes and figure the trade-offs between, you know, not doing such a great job passing the test but doing a real, you know, but also getting these kids to love reading and we'll figure out the right trade-offs. You know, that's not going to fly because you're in a job of getting people to pass the test. So I, I don't say this lightly, uh, but I do think that it matters. And I think part of the problem, and this gets back to the funder-evaluator dialogue, is that <clears throat> there are going to be unintended consequences to your program if you are distorting the system by diverting it from making sort of reasonable attainment on the things it needs to do to be viable. Um, and that's a tough conversation to have. But I think it's true. Uh, and I think it's one of the kinds of conversations that have to have. Now, if Danielle is right, and this thing is set in stone even before you get to do anything about it, it makes the problem even worse. But the idea that you've got funders who are only willing to have conversations, if they're willing to have conversations at all, about maximizing a single outcome uh, is almost guaranteed to get the program into, not the program into trouble, but get the cluster of outcomes and therefore the community you're dealing with into trouble. Uh, and by the way, I often like to say that when there are unintended consequences, most of them are going to be negative. And, a lot of people just sort of chalk that up to Johnny Morrell's personality, <laughs> which may be true too. But I really believe it's true, and I think this is one of, this is one of the dynamics why it's true. So <clears throat> that's one example of what I mean by having to change the funder dialogue. Now, methodologically, this is easy, right? If I said to you, look, here are the three variables, outcomes that we really care about, and we care about jointly optimizing, can you make a methodology to measure those things? We can all do that, right? So it's not as if it's a technical problem, but it's a mission problem, or I don't know what you want to call it. It's a contractual problem. It's, you know, whatever you want to call it. So that's one example I've been thinking about a lot lately. Uh, the other example I've been thinking about lately is that really, don't worry about the picture, I'll explain it. Really profound change can happen <coughs> in very small and incremental ways. Uh, and if you think about that, that has implications for doing evaluation. Uh, and the question is, we know how to make these measurements and how to make these observations. And you know, whether you're talking about predicting or explaining or just saying something reasonable about the program, we know how to do all these kinds of things. The problem is that we get into trouble if we don't, if we don't have people we're working for who think these things 
can't happen very, very slowly. So here's my example. I made it up. I like to make up examples. Mostly I like to make them up because no matter how many things I've evaluated, it's almost impossible to find a real-life example that actually illustrates all the points you want to make. So I always pervert my examples to wrap them around points that I want to make. So we've got the civil society program, right? And the way it works is it says, look, we're going to recruit civil society organizations and we're going to give them technical assistance, right? And because we're going to give them technical assistance, each organization is going to be able to do a better job of doing whatever it's supposed to be doing, right? And so, you know, one civil society organization wants to, you know, I don't know, improve people's eating habits, and another one wants to increase uh, participation in voting, and another one cares about, uh, you know, <coughs> traffic safety. I mean, whatever these things happen to be, if you make each one of these organizations more technically competent, they're going to be better off at getting kids to school, getting the speed bumps put off, you know, in the streets, whatever it happens to be. And, you know, presumably there are going to be some collective goals. It's a perfectly reasonable program. Well, what happens if someone comes along who is not part of these organizations and says to someone working in the program, you know, I see you're giving technical support to civil society organizations. I don't have a civil society organization, but I'm thinking of starting one to, I don't know, change the way in which poodles get their haircuts. Uh, and can you give me a little, I don't know, it's got to be something, right? Can you give me a little technical assistance and how to assistance and how to do that? So the person working for this organization says to himself or herself, "Well, I got some spare time. It's not that big a deal. Yeah, I'll sit down with this person and help him out." Now that might be a one-time thing and it goes away, but you can easily imagine how, from that very small change, the entire nature of the program can change, right? So now, including the program you've got at the top. You've got all these new civil society organizations that you've been, so all of a sudden you've got this program that is instrumental in getting new civil society organizations uh, put together. Uh, and they're going to have their own sets of goals, and to whatever extent uh, they're going to interact with each other, you're going to have better collective goals. Uh, and the only point I want to make is that <coughs> what you're seeing here is that because of what seemed like some very small kinds of changes, you end up with a radical change in the program. And in fact, the things that got these things going in the first place are probably so small and seemingly so insignificant that no matter how good a job you did of monitoring your program, you probably wouldn't even notice it, right? You know, someone comes and says, well, you know, a couple of our people are having lunch with these folks who want to start a new civil society organization. You know, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have even thought to write that down. <laughs> Right, if I were starting things. Uh, now, I might take notice once a large change took place and all this stuff on the bottom actually began to happen. But by that time, it would be a little bit late to, you know, sort of collect the baseline data, you know, that I thought needed to be collected to watch the trajectory. It would be a little bit too late to start talking to the funder and say, you know, I'm contractually bound only to study the top. But you've done something really good here, and look at all this stuff on the bottom nobody expected. Can we squeeze in some contractual obligations, you know, or at least some contractual slack that will let me look at that stuff as well? Well, you know, if you don't have enough lead time, the probability of doing that is pretty minimal. So uh, my point is that very small <laughs> changes can lead to radical change, and that has implications for methodology, but it mostly has implications for can you have an agreement with your funders to even let you look at this stuff? Um, and here's another example where methodologically I don't think it's a big deal. Right? We all know how to do this. And in fact, the methodology isn't really that much different than the one that we've put in place to deal with the thing on top. Um, so it's not that it's technically hard, but from the practical point of view, if you don't have funders who understand the importance of developmental trajectories based on small change, you're going to get into all kinds of trouble in terms of being able to do the evaluation. So that's another example. Ah, here's a great example now. Help me out. How do I do this? I push this button. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just tell you what the deal is here before we get things going. 
remember when I said earlier that change can happen either per no I'm, I'm, I like it this way for a minute is that and because I have a mouse and not a touchpad I can actually do it uh, is that change can happen very quickly and change can happen very slowly but it doesn't tend to happen in the intermediate stage uh, and I'm going to give you an example of this, this which comes out of uh, network behavior and it's not as if I think that we as evaluators well, sometimes we as evaluators need to worry about this in terms of networks because we're actually evaluating community kinds of activities where honest to goodness real network behavior can take place. But even if we don't do that, it's still true that we deal with outcomes that are connected without realizing that when things are connected, you get change that happens in strange ways. Methodologically, we can, methodologically, we can deal with it. But if our, the dealing with the funder, saying to the funder, well, you've got this program, eventually it's going to do a lot of good, but you're not going to see any change for a long time. Right? That's a tough kind of conversation to have, but it can happen. <clears throat> so here's the example. Um, anybody know what NetLogo is? It's a great program, agent-based program. And if nothing else, even if you never write a line of NetLogo code, download the program and call up the models library and you'll have no end of fun with the models library. So this is a model where it builds networks. Let me see if I can. So I gotta move this way over here. That will, whoops. Does that work? So let me tell you what we got here. On the right, we have an unconnected network. And they could have sprinkled those randomly, but I guess for reasons of pretty, they just kind of put them all in a circle. But it's a network of 227 nodes, right? And they're completely unconnected. What's going to happen in this program is this. You're going to pick two nodes, you're going to randomly connect them. You're going to pick another two nodes, random, I'm sorry. You're going to pick two nodes randomly and you're going to connect them. Pick another two nodes randomly and you're going to connect them. And the question is, when you do enough connections, What's the size of the largest clump in the network? Uh, the prettiest part of this is what you can see on the right. But the important part of this is the graph on the left, which is how many connections per mode versus the size of the network. And, and this is really, this is going to grab your attention. But this is the graph you really want to look at. Let's see, set up, go. So you see it's beginning to connect them, and if you look at that thingy down there, right, that's the relationship between the number that are connected and the size of the largest node. And you'll notice you have an awful lot of connections, but it's really not changing very much. I mean, it's actually not changing very much at all even though you're beginning to have lots and lots of connections. Those who have already been selected can be selected again. If they can yes, be yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's making a little progress, but as they say, nothing to write home about. What's the difference between the two colors? That I'm not sure, actually. I, I, I think the colors show the, 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 the biggest ones. <coughs> I think they show the biggest connections. No, I think, Johnny, I think they're the origin nodes. I'm not no, sure about that. Yeah. I read it once. It's, you see where it says interface code and info? Yeah. If, a, if we pulled up the info, it would explain it. Yeah, because they're not connected. Yeah, they are. If you look at the red. The reds are connected. No, I should have worn my glasses. Sorry. But you see what's, <laughs> the point is you see what's happened here. You get very little change, all of a sudden you get really dramatic change. And as I said, uh, it's not as if we as evaluators deal with formal networks too often. Although if we do, we obviously got to watch out for this stuff. But it's the idea that in this world, you can have situations where if things are connected at all, you're going to be able to see very little change for a long time, and then you're going to see very radical change. Now, methodologically, we can deal with that. It has to do with the spacing of your observations, right, and the sensitivity of your analysis and it's not as if we don't know how to deal with this stuff. The problem we have is that if we have funders who don't think that this is going to happen, say, well, you know, you're going to sort of get a 
great line and you know maybe it'll have a little inflection point but it's you know basically not going to be a radical change in your out in, in in your in your outcome measure as well I mean guess what there can be so I use that as an example oh just as an FYI just to answer Chris's question what happened to my oh yeah. there it is I'm gonna look it up don't worry Danny I know I'm just the way these things are all done that's the info so it explains all about it and if you ever wanted to really read the code on these things you can read the code and what you really want to do someday just for the fun of it is to go to the models library and it goes from art biology uh, epidemiological models there's a lot of stuff in chemistry a lot of stuff in physics a bunch of systems dynamics a bunch of psychology and sociology and math and as I said you can have endless fun with the models library in any case so my only point here is that if you think of the world in terms of complex behavior you can get no change for a very long time and a very radical change very quickly now I don't think what I just showed you is, is particularly surprising to people sitting around this table but it's certainly surprising to a lot of people I've tried to explain it in terms of why I want to do an evaluation the way I want to do it and that's really the issue it seems to me um, here's another example which I'm not going to get into too much uh, but if you think about either complex models or systems dynamics models one of the things you're going to find out is that when you get feedback loops really weird things can happen and let's just leave it at that for the moment but the point is there's nothing wrong with really weird things happening with feedback loops it's the way the world works you get into trouble if you don't know about it so the example I have here is <clears throat> we have this program and on the top you know we're training people with entrepreneurial behavior where's my thingy go there it is right you train them you get new business activity standard of living is going to go up not such a crazy notion I say well but you know maybe we've got some feedback loops here the standard of living is going to increase people's interest in entrepreneurial behavior well maybe even more feedback loops right you're going to get new business <coughs> activity it's going to improve standard of living but it's also going to improve increase inequality amongst the population which we would never put in our models because that implies putting a negative outcome in our models and the people we work for don't want negative outcomes in their models but let's say we persevered uh, and then you get community cohesion now you've got all kinds of strange feedback loops and I guarantee if you were to model this you you might find chaotic behavior you might find nonlinear behavior uh, and that's all okay because from a methodological point of view if we knew these feedback loops were there we could deal with that you know if we began to look at the feedback loops and we began to see that there was um, sort of nonlinear behavior that was going to um, really do damage to the program what we really know is that the people running that program are going to observe that they're going to do something about it right you don't let positive feedback loops just sort of run amok you know you're managing your program but the problem is that we as evaluators need to keep an eye on that stuff and we can only keep an eye on that stuff if we can make our funders believe that there might be feedback loops and we need to take that seriously um, and right now they don't I mean usually you can get something like this you know you can get a simple feedback loop you, I find when I talk to people it, it doesn't seem too hard but when you begin to think in terms of the really bizarre behavior that can happen with multiple feedback loops I shouldn't say multiple feedback loops even a system like this can technically go chaotic but when you begin to get lots of feedback loops you need to get your funders to believe that it's worth trying to identify these things and it's worth trying to measure them uh, and again that's the part that's not so easy now by the way 
you know, do you know, part of the problem is what are the feedback loops? You know, now, if I evaluate a program, I'm obviously smart enough to be able to anticipate what all the feedback loops are going to be. But since other people are mere mortals, it's more, you know, it, it's likely, <laughs> it's likely that I might not. So you have this problem of can you identify these things in advance? But my only point is that feedback loops can make systems behave in crazy ways. From, a, from an evaluation point of view, we can deal with that. But from the point of view of having funders who believe that's true and are willing to build that into their expectations and therefore give you the ability to invoke necessary methodologies, that's not so easy. I don't know if you've ever tried this, but I've tried talking to people about feedback loops and they tend to put a lot of them in for reasons of explanation. I mean, I've seen lots of models with gazillions of feedback loops. But when I start talking about, well, okay, let's take that seriously, you know, and is that going to have implications for the outcomes you want for your programs and for generating, you know, changes that might not be so desirable or, you know, whatever it might be, all of a sudden the conversation tends to stop. So. Here's just another example where there's a pattern of change. The methodology is easy, but engaging in that dialogue is not so simple, meaning I have failed at it. Johnny, is there yeah. any software which would implement the Yeah, there is. Uh, there is just this systems dynamic <laughs> software. Uh, there's a thing called, I've not played with it. There's a thing called Venson. Venson? Does that ring a bell? There's a thing called Vensum or Vensing, which I think has uh, is a piece of shareware. I mean, if you look up systems dynamics software, there's sort of a gazillion varieties of it. But um, I think Vensin is a freebie where you can actually, you know, define the stocks and flows and the rate of, you know, things moving in and out of buffers and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I've never played with it, but, but you could do that, which by the way, I think would be a good thing to do because you'd sit there you know, with your client and say, well, but supposing this feedback loop really existed, what might that thing look like? It doesn't mean that it can predict behavior. Well, there's a lot of reasons to believe that you can't use models to predict behavior, but that's a separate question. But it certainly helps people understand what might be going on. So that's another example. I'm going to skip over this. So this is kind of what I really believe is that we kind of think that our program evaluation, our programs are what we see on the right. There's an intervention, there's a strong methodology, you get some outcomes, isn't that cool? You know, the real problem is that these programs are embedded in this very complicated uh, world of ours. And again, the problem is that you can't get people to recognize that. Um, now, as I said, I have a, so, I have a whole separate conversation as to uh, why it is that that's true and why it is that that's probably okay that they're ignoring everything else. But, as I said, that's, that's separate. But, but I think this is the reality. Uh, and it, it's easy enough to get people to believe this. If you sit down with them informally, they'd say, well, yeah, it's a complicated world. Uh, I've never done an evaluation for someone who didn't believe that. But getting them to sit around the conference table and say, let's build a methodology to recognize this stuff, that's not so simple. In fact, it's damn near impossible. I'm sorry? I guess they're ignoring it because it's beyond their best interest. Right. Doesn't put anything in their pocket to acknowledge it. I have to finish by 12, by 1. Give or take. We should have an offline conversation about that. Because what I really believe is that if you took vested interest and selfishness off the table, there are very good reasons why they're ignoring it. And there are adaptive reasons why they're ignoring it. And there are rational reasons why they live within those stovepipes and there are rational reasons why those stovepipes and cubby holes exist within the organization in the first place. There's a downside to it, obviously, <coughs> and we like to complain. All. Nobody complains about the problem more than I do. Those goddamn idiots, we know this is connected to that. How can they ignore it? You know, what fools? The truth is if you take a good look at it, there's some good reasons for it, but it's a separate conversation. Uh, I am going to skip that because time is short.
Let me get to this part. So we have this problem with, uh, with interacting with our uh, stakeholders. And the question is, how can we do about it? What can we do about it? Uh, and the answer has to do with models. And I'll tell you where this came from. Uh, for a long time, I have been you playing around. I've been doing research on using agent-based models as an adjunct to doing traditional evaluation. And you know, I have YouTube videos on this subject. So if anybody's interested, I'll give you the YouTube videos. Uh, but the point is that I, I had a, an epiphany a while back because I was doing a paper presentation for a big conference in The Hague on unintended consequences. And so I was thinking about this quite a lot. And what hit me is that the fact that I like complexity and the fact that I like agent-based modeling and the fact that I'm doing research on agent-based modeling and evaluation is kind of irrelevant. What matters is having a model. And the model can be anything. The model can be, you know, the, the, the Kellogg model. I forget, what are those things called? Inputs. You guys know what they are. Inputs, outputs. Inputs, outputs, throughputs, and then it's outcomes. outcomes. Yeah, you guys have seen this, right? And by the way, I like those models because they're modest. They say, do a bunch of things here, a bunch of things here are going to happen, but we don't know what you have to do exactly here, know exactly what there is going to happen. So I actually kind of like those models. Uh, but the point is, it could be a model like that. It could be a model like the one I showed originally with just a couple of little boxes. Uh, it doesn't matter, right? The fact of the matter is that if you have a model, you can do what I'm suggesting here. And what I'm suggesting is that you develop the model and you use the model to construct your evaluation, which is what we have at time one. But time two, time three, time four, et cetera, what I'm arguing is that in a systematic way, and the real problem is systematic, because I don't know any evaluator that hasn't at some point you know, revisited their model in the middle of the data analysis you know, when new data come in. So it's not as if we don't do this. Um, but to do this systematically, and to use the model, I'm sorry, to use the data you've been collecting to modify the model and then to inspect the model, say, well, but if this is really what the model looks like, maybe you ought to be including your evaluation such and such, which you're not doing right now. Right. Say, well, you know, maybe such and such is a good idea. I'll decide to include that in my data collection. You come back X time late and you say, well, you know, you told me that I haven't been looking at Z and I ought to be doing that and I didn't find Z, but I found Z prime. So you look at the model, and by the way, a lot of this is we've met the enemy and they are us, because the people building the model are often the people involved in this all other activity. It's just kind of a question of what hat you're wearing. Uh, but in any case, they say, well, gee, uh, we thought Z would happen. That's not true, but it's nice to know Z prime is happening. You know, we'll factor that into that model, into our model. We'll see where it goes from here. So the idea is you get this continual iteration between collecting real data and developing the model. Uh, and that usually doesn't happen. Even if the model is revised sometime in the middle of an evaluation, it's not done systematically. Or let's put it this way. I've never done it systematically. Uh, and I don't know other people who have as well. And what I really believe is that one of the ways to shift the conversation between the funders and the evaluators is to engage in this kind of an activity on a systematic basis. Now, you run into a lot of problems, right? If you look at that list I have on the right, it's one thing to say, let's do it systematically. It's another thing to say, well, what does that mean? Does it mean every X number of months, you know, calendar time? Does it mean stages, you know, in, in, in the development of the project? Does it mean only if something unexpected happens that you need to investigate? So what it means to be systematic when you make your choices for timing is actually not such a trivial question, but you got to come up with it somehow. Uh, how do you talk to these people? You can get them together in groups. You can get them, get them together one-to-one. -one. I'm a, personally a big believer in um, sort of Delphi methodologies and I've always thought that given that I have a PhD in social psychology, you think I have more respect for the wisdom of groups. I actually hate groups because you get them people all together and you get status differences and personality differences and so sort you of get all this weird stuff going on. So I'd much rather do a Delphi methodology where I sort of 
you know, get the consensus one-on-one, -on -one, reflect it back to people, have them talk, et cetera, and so forth. Once you have all that, if you want to have a group, you can do it. So that's my favorite personal methodology. This last one is important, which is the diversity of participants. Uh, it's one thing to say all oh, the people need to get together. You should have some funders and evaluators. But who really gets to do this? I mean, for instance, uh, Donald Campbell, may he rest in peace, once said that uh, when you design an evaluation, people who are opposed to the program should be involved in the design of the evaluation. Well, I don't know about you, but has anybody ever gotten an opponent of a program designed in an involved in the design of an evaluation? Guaranteed way to get thrown out of the room if you try something like that. But he was right then and we're right now. Uh, but in general, this idea of diversity of input, even if people are all in favor of the program, you still have different points of view. Uh, and I used to believe that diversity matters just as a social good because it sounded like a good idea, but everybody ought to read Scott Page's book called, I think it's Complexity and Diversity or Diversity and Complexity or whatever, but he does this really cogent explanation based on sort of more mathematics than I like to read, but really very good explanation of what diversity means, what different kinds of diversity are, and why it makes a difference for problem solving. But in any case, you need to worry about the diversity of outputs, of participants, if you're going to systematically have these right conversations take place. And finally, you know, I'll finish up on time. My favorite research questions, what I'd really like is to find some money to actually do some of this. And the reason is that, you know, this is all a hypothesis if you think about it. It seems like an awfully good idea, or at least an awfully good idea to me. Uh, but, um, you know, what's the reality here? Um, so, for instance, are there conditions for which it's particularly worth the effort? Because what I'm suggesting is not a trivial piece of work. Well, there are probably times when you really do need these systematic efforts at model building with diverse input. I suspect, <coughs> although I hate to admit it, I suspect there are times when it's probably not a real important thing to do. <coughs> you know, but what is it? Uh, what's the best timing, right? I'm sort of spitting out, well, it can be calendar driven, it can be event driven. Uh, there are lots of ways to decide when you ought to redo the, uh, redo the model and go to the trouble of, you know, interacting with all these people. Uh, but it's not clear to me how you know what the best timing is. Uh, mix of point of view. It's very nice to say, let's have diverse input. But if you think about that, you got to recruit people, you got to get them to understand what you're doing, you got to be able to deal with all the different opinions, you got to deal with the fact that if you have all these different opinions, some people are really not going to like some of those opinions. To so say, let's have diverse input uh, is one of these things that seems easy but may in fact not be. So the real issue is how diverse do things have to be with respect to what? And that's an empirical question. Um, and then, of course, how do evaluators respond to unintended consequences now? Uh, I need to expand a small amount of research. There was actually a fair amount of research. When I wrote my book, I thought, my God, I must be the only one dealing with this. But the truth is that it's not true. Uh, and in fact, uh, do you guys read of Altog at all? Did you see my post on the Scottish Enlightenment? Mm -hmm. Turns out this guy wrote this article on how the giants of the Scottish Enlightenment, meaning Adam Smith and all his buddies, actually talked a lot about emergence and unintended consequences. Um, so I felt pretty good about that. But exactly two people wrote to me and said, I'm glad you made that post. And except for that, I got nothing. <laughs> That's about what you can expect on average anyway. Generally. Well, and this is pretty <laughs> esoteric stuff. But, you know, we're talking about the giants of the Scottish Enlightenment and how their belief in unintended consequences affects social science to this day. Everybody will read that article. But the point is that, <laughs> says I, right? But, but the point is that this question of how do you respond to unintended consequences, I think I know the answer. A few of my partners in crime think they know the answer. But it's really not so obvious. And what I'm not going to talk about is what that's all about, because that's really where I was going to go into some detail about how I think we ought to do it. But trust me, the fact that I think we ought to do it means that there are probably a lot of things I'm not right about. Although, 
trust me. Ask my children, I don't tell you. But I'd be happy. So things I'd expound about at length is why silos are good. That's one of your questions about uh, connections. Your question about how you sort of deal with the fact that it's hard to get at the right people. Uh, all this stuff I actually are have. Are you going to hang around for a while? Yeah. Because I've got a ton of questions. Good. I have oh. graphics on all this and lectures on all this, but I will shut up. And if people have <laughs> questions, I will make up answers because it's already 103. Please one. So thank you so much for coming. My pleasure.